You're listening to audio from the Village Church, a community that's formed by the gospel and sent on God's mission, gathering weekly in the heart of downtown Hamilton, Ohio. For more information about the village or to connect with us, you can find us online at myvillagechurch.com. Hey all, my name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors of the village. Thanks for spending this Good Friday with us. Imagine darkness all around. As far as you could see, darkness pitch black, darkness thick enough to touch. And not just through the night, but on into morning. And not only through the morning, but into the afternoon, into the evening, and into the next day. And not just for one day, but for three entire days across the entire nation. That is what Egypt experienced in the ninth strike or the ninth plague uh, against them in God's plan to rescue his people from the mighty hand of Pharaoh and, and the captivity that they were facing in Egypt. Pitch black, total dark is, is no fun. Uh, you can't see, you can't navigate, you can't do the things that you want to do. In fact, it's one of the earliest fears that kids face when they, when they realize that they should fear things. They fear darkness because it's, it's the unknown and you don't know what's lurking out there. And, and, and that fear spills over into uh, adulthood for many. There are many adults who are afraid of darkness and, and just not knowing what is in front of them or around them or near them. But darkness for the daylight hours was especially significant for Egypt. As we've been journeying through this series in Exodus, uh, captives set free, we've seen that, <clears throat> that the Egyptians were very religious people. They, they worshipped uh, just under a hundred gods, and, and these gods were represented by many different things, and God has been opposing them. They had a special relationship with the Nile River, and, and the Nile uh, brought forth life for them. But they had an even more significant relationship with the sun. Uh, the god of all gods for Egypt was Ra, and he was the sun god. And if he was powerless to stop this god of the Hebrews, surely the end was near. God was confronting their god of gods. And I can't help but think that many of them began to realize that. But the darkness wasn't the worst of it. Nine plagues in, and still there was no escape. Uh, what it seems like was this darkness was the quiet before the storm of ruin, where God uh, leveraged the weight of his hand to rescue his people. One strike of judgment, one strike of rescue remained the tenth plague. And that tenth plague is the death of the firstborn in Egypt. Who knows, how, uh, who, who knows how long Pharaoh thought God would continue to play this game? It's as if he, he's, he's taking shots and he's, he's getting limbs chopped off and, and he's uh, unable to fight and, and he's continually taunting God, spitting at him. And, and we read on in 11 and we see the setup for this final plague. And so I'm reading ex Exodus 11, 1. And on through, the Lord said to Moses, Yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. Which is an encouragement, because Moses has been doing this time and time again with the promise. And he, and he doesn't know when this is going to happen. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor, neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Remember when God called Moses to, to join him in this journey to confront Pharaoh? He said that, that when they left, they would even plunder the Egyptians. And so we see that happening. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and in the sight of the people, which you can imagine that Pharaoh just 
Love that. So Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill and all the firstborn of the cattle. We see just in this tiny little sliver that God, he is not a God of partiality. And, and that's true in the way that he blesses and offers grace and offers mercy. And it's also true in his judgment. We read on, There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been nor ever will be again, but not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel, and all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, you and all the people who follow you, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of the land. So that was the promise, and that promise would bring the final death blow to Pharaoh and to Egypt, and it would free the Hebrews so that they might know that their God is the one and only God, the only God who is the God I am. So as we continue in chapter 12, God tells Moses, he says, there's a new beginning on the horizon, and, and it's as if he leans in real close to whisper the plan that will bring about the rescue. And, and his tone seems silent almost and, and somber and pointed and weighty and sincere and painfully hopeful. And he, and he tells them the plans and the details of the final plague. And so I'm not going to read this. I'm summarizing, but I encourage you to read this section on your own or with your family. This is what he says. <clears throat> Each family, and if your family isn't large enough, Share with your neighbors. In all the congregation of Israel, each family will take a lamb on the tenth day, and they will prepare that lamb. That lamb must be one year old, and it must be perfect to the eye, unspotted and unblemished. And he says, On the fourteenth day, in all of Israel, in every home in Israel, kill it at twilight. Kill the lamb. And then uh, that may have been common as they would have often killed animals to eat them and to sacrifice and, and so on. But, but on the 14th day, they were to kill it at twilight and they were to sprinkle the blood on the doorpost and the lintel. And so that's the two posts that are holding the door upright and then the, the cross up top, the header. They're to sprinkle the, the blood of the lamb on those things. And then it says, uh, then the Lord says, eat the flesh for dinner, so so have a meal, roast it over an open flame with unleavened bread, and, and he has some other details in there, but he says, kill the unblemished lamb, eat it for dinner, smear its blood on the doorpost. And then as we're reading on in Exodus chapter 12, I want to jump in at, at verse uh, 12. Just before that, it says, it is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the, the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So he says, I will execute judgment, but the blood will spare you. The blood on your do doorpost will spare you and your family. And if we jump down to verse 24 uh, through 28, we see uh, how this unfolds. It says, you shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, the promised land, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, 
It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and they worshiped. They were hearing the story of God's rescue. Then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. That's just what the Lord did too. He spared them. That's just what the people did and that's just what the Lord did. The darkness of the ninth plague was eclipsed by the darkness of the tenth. The final stroke, the final strike had come. And just as Exodus began with the death of the firstborn as as the local news around town, it will end the same way. Only this time the tides turn. Moses escaped Pharaoh's plot to kill him among the Hebrews, but Egypt's sons, they would not escape the hand of God. So at this point, Israel was primed for freedom that God had been promising all along that they might worship God freely. But for those of us who are students of God's story, and students of God's story with his people, we know that the story, it doesn't end here. We know the darkness seen in Egypt would be revisited in an even more uh, intense and extensive way, not only in Egypt, but in all the earth, brought on by the death of the firstborn of all creation, Jesus, fully God, fully man, having no beginning nor end, being one with the Father and the Spirit. The light of Christmas gave way to the darkness of the cross. The Son of God, Jesus, he came, he dwelt among his people as we were uh, sinful and broken. He came, he lived in a way that, that no other human had ever lived He was perfect in every way. He pleased God with every breath, with every motive, with every action that he did. And he died. And when he died, darkness fell. Now I say that this was more extensive because in the Old Testament, Egypt was clearly the enemy as we're reading through the account and the history of of God rescuing his people from Egypt. God was rescuing his people from slavery to that nation. He made distinction, and we've seen it plague after plague. He spared his people from darkness, and he spared them from death. But in the New Testament, we begin to see the greater reality at play. We begin to see the the bigger enemy at play. Satan and the powers of darkness and sin had its way with all mankind. Sin reigned outside of us, and what we see is, is sin reigns inside of us, and it takes root within us. And so we all once walked in darkness. In Egypt, God made distinction between his own and his enemy. But as the story unfolds, God reveals that we are all God's enemy by our own rebellion, by our own corrupt, broken, and sinful hearts. So at Christ's death, the world felt its darkest day. And for three hours, darkness fell upon the earth. And today we call that day Good Friday, the day that God died on behalf of man, that he being perfect died a sinner, not because of his own sin, but because of the sin that we brought on him. So why would we call that Good Friday? Why would that day be a good day. So what, what, what does it all mean? And where does that leave us? Well, well, I think it leaves us with, with three things in mind. And the first one is this, we get to sit in that darkness. It's so easy for us to bypass that and look forward to, to Easter and resurrection and, and hope and, and, and all the life that God brings through the life of Jesus. But as for today, this good Friday, we get to sit in that darkness. We don't stay there But it's okay to sit and gaze at our sin's work. And our sin brings death. The second thing we get to to do is we get to remember 
the darkness. Or not only sit in it, but we get to remember it. We get to recall our God's work to overcome our sin by laying down his life and offering his life and offering us life through his death. It was Pharaoh's heart that broke Egypt, but it was our hard hearts that broke Jesus. And so when we read this in the Exodus account and in Exodus 12, the blood, right? We, we get to see the, the, greater, um, the, the greater accessibility to this reality, the blood Christ's perfect, uh, the, the perfect lamb Jesus, his blood shall be a sign for you on the houses and not just on the houses, but on the hearts of man where you are. And, and God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague or in our case, in the new covenant, no death will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land. This was God's rescue to Israel. And this is Christ's work for all who confess their sin by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. So we get to sit in that darkness. We get to remember the darkness. And we get to call the darkness good. On its own. God's justice against our sin is served and we are rescued back to God. But it doesn't end there. That the, the darkest of the dark fell on that day and the only way things can turn our hearts are for us to see the glimmer of light. And in that, we see the light of God begin, beginning to flicker as, as we sit in the darkness, as we remember the darkness, and we, looking back, we call that darkness good. And because that darkness wouldn't remain, and because the story doesn't end there, therefore, we have hope. So would you continue reflecting, repenting, and responding as we sing together?